The Innocents Abroad by Mark Twain, Chapter Two, Grand Preparations, an Imposing Dignitary, The European Exodus, Mr. Blucher's Opinion, State Room Number Ten, The Assembling of the Clans, At Sea at Last. Occasionally during the following month I dropped in at 117 Wall Street to inquire how the repairing and refurbishing of the vessel was coming on, how additions to the passenger list were averaging, how many people the committee were decreeing not select every day, and banishing in sorrow and tribulation. I was glad to know that we were to have a little printing press on board, and issue a daily newspaper of our own. I was glad to learn that our piano, our parlor organ, and our melodeon were to be the best instruments of the kind that could be had in the market. I was proud to observe that among our excursionists were three ministers of the gospel, eight doctors, sixteen or eighteen ladies, several military and naval chieftains with sounding titles, an ample crop of professors of various kinds, and a gentleman who had commissioner of the united states of america to europe asia and africa thundering after his name in one awful blast i had carefully prepared myself to take rather a back seat in that ship because of the uncommonly select material that would alone be permitted to pass through the camel's eye of that committee on credentials I had schooled myself to expect an imposing array of military and naval heroes, and to have to set that back seat still further back, in consequence of it, maybe. But I state frankly that I was all unprepared for this crusher. I fell under that titular avalanche, a torn and blighted thing. I said that if that potentate must go over in our ship, why, I supposed he must, but that to my thinking, when the United States considered it necessary to send a dignitary of that tonnage across the ocean, it would be in better taste and safer to take him apart and carry him over in sections in several ships. Ah, uh, if I had only known then that he was only a common mortal, and that his mission had nothing more overpowering about it than the collecting of seeds, and uncommon yams, and extraordinary cabbages, and peculiar bullfrogs for that poor, useless, innocent, mildewed old fossil, the Smithsonian Institute, I would have felt so much relieved. During that memorable month I basked in the happiness of being, for once in my life, drifting with the tide of a great popular movement. Everybody was going to Europe. I, too, was going to Europe. Everybody was going to the famous Paris Exposition. I, too, was going to the Paris Exposition. The steamship lines were carrying Americans out of the various ports of the country at the rate of four or five thousand a week in the aggregate. If I met a dozen individuals during that month who were not going to Europe shortly, I have no distinct remembrance of it now. I walked about the city a good deal with a young Mr. Blucher, who was booked for the excursion. He was confiding, good-natured, unsophisticated, companionable but he was not a man to set the river on fire. He had the most extraordinary notions about this European exodus, and came at last to consider the whole nation as packing up for emigration to France. We stepped into a store on Broadway one day, where he bought a handkerchief, and, when the man could not make change, Mr. B. said, "'Never mind, I'll hand it to you in Paris.' "'But I am not going to Paris.' How is what did I understand you to say? I said I am not going to Paris. Not going to Paris? Not g Well, then, where in the nation are you going to? Nowhere at all. Not anywhere whatsoever? Not any place on earth but this? Not any place at all but just this. Stay here all summer. My comrade took his purchases, and walked out of the store without a word, walked out with an injured look upon his countenance. Up the street apiece he broke silence, and said impressively, 
it was a lie. That is my opinion of it. In the fullness of time the ship was ready to receive her passengers. I was introduced to the young gentleman who was to be my roommate, and found him to be intelligent, cheerful of spirit, unselfish, full of generous impulses, patient, considerate, and wonderfully good-natured. Not any passenger that sailed in the Quaker City will withhold his endorsement of what I have just said. We selected a stateroom forward of the wheel, on the starboard side, below decks. It had two berths in it, a dismal dead light, a sink with a wash-bowl in it, and a long, sumptuously cushioned locker, which was to do service as a sofa, partly, and partly as a hiding-place for other things. Notwithstanding all this furniture, there was still room to turn around in, but not to swing a cat in, at least with entire security to the cat. However, the room was large for a ship's stateroom, and was in every way satisfactory. The vessel was appointed to sail on a certain Saturday early in June. A little after noon on that distinguished Saturday I reached the ship and went on board. All was bustle and confusion. I have seen that remark before somewhere. The pier was crowded with carriages and men. Passengers were arriving and hurrying on board. The vessel's decks were encumbered with trunks and valises. Groups of excursionists, arrayed in unattractive travelling costumes, were moping about in a drizzling rain, and looking as droopy and woe-begone as so many molting chickens. The gallant flag was up, but it was under the spell, too, and hung limp and disheartened by the mast. Altogether it was the bluest, bluest spectacle. It was a pleasure excursion. There was no gain saying that, because the program said so. It was so nominated in the bond, but it surely hadn't the general aspect of one. Finally, above the banging and rumbling and shouting and hissing of steam, rang the order to CAST OFF! A sudden rush to the gangways, a scampering ashore of visitors, a revolution of the wheels, and we were off. The picnic was begun. Two very mild cheers went up from the dripping crowd on the pier. We answered them gently from the slippery decks. The flag made an effort to wave, and failed. The battery of guns spake not. The ammunition was out. We steamed down to the foot of the harbor, and came to anchor. It was still raining, and not only raining, but storming. Outside we could see, ourselves, that there was a tremendous sea on. We must lie still in the calm harbor till the storm should abate. Our passengers hailed from fifteen states. Only a few of them had ever been to sea before. Manifestly it would not do to pit them against a full-blown tempest until they had got their sea-legs on. Toward evening the two steam-tugs that had accompanied us with a rollicking champagne party of young New Yorkers on board, who wished to bid farewell to one of our number in due and ancient form, departed, and we were alone on the deep, on deep five fathoms, and anchored fast to the bottom, and out in the solemn rain at that. This was pleasuring with a vengeance. It was an appropriate relief when the gong sounded for prayer-meeting. The first Saturday night of any other pleasure excursion might have been devoted to whist and dancing. But I submitted to the unprejudiced mind if it would have been in good taste for us to engage in such frivolities, considering what we had gone through and the frame of mind we were in. We would have shone at a wake, but not at anything more festive. However, there is always a cheering influence about the sea, and in my berth that night, rocked by the measured swell of the waves and lulled by the murmur of the distant surf, I soon passed tranquilly out of all consciousness of the dreary experiences of the day and damaging premonitions of the future. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Averaging the Passengers Far, Far at Sea Tribulation among the Patriarchs, Seeking Amusement Under Difficulties, Five Captains in the Ship. All day Sunday at anchor, 
The storm had gone down a great deal, but the sea had not. It was still piling its frothy hills high in air outside, as we could plainly see with the glasses. We could not properly begin a pleasure excursion on Sunday. We could not offer untried stomachs to so pitiless a sea as that. We must lie still till Monday, and we did. But we had repetitions of church and prayer meetings, and so, of course, we were just as eligibly situated as we could have been anywhere. I was up early that Sabbath morning, and was early to breakfast. I felt a perfectly natural desire to have a good, long, unprejudiced look at the passengers at a time when they should be free from self-consciousness, which is at breakfast, when such a moment occurs in the lives of human beings at all. I was greatly surprised to see so many elderly people, I might almost say so many venerable people. A glance at the long lines of heads was apt to make one think it was all gray. But it was not. There was a tolerably fair sprinkling of young folks, and another fair sprinkling of gentlemen and ladies who were non-committal as to age, being neither actually old or absolutely young. The next morning we weighed anchor and went to sea. It was a great happiness to get away from this dragging, dispiriting delay. I thought there never was such gladness in the air before, such brightness in the sun, such beauty in the sea. I was satisfied with the picnic then, and with all its belongings. All my malicious instincts were dead within me, and as America faded out of sight, I think a spirit of charity rose up in their place that was as boundless for the time being as the broad ocean that was heaving its billows about us. I wished to express my feelings, I wished to lift up my voice and sing, but I did not know anything to sing, and so I was obliged to give up the idea. It was no loss to the ship, though, perhaps. It was breezy and pleasant, but the sea was still very rough. One could not promenade without risking his neck. At one point the bowsprit was taking a deadly aim at the sun in mid-heaven, and at the next it was trying to harpoon a shark in the bottom of the ocean. What a weird sensation it is to feel the stem of a ship sinking swiftly from under you and see the bow climbing high away among the clouds. One's safest course that day was to clasp a railing and hang on. Walking was too precarious a pastime. By some happy fortune I was not seasick. That was a thing to be proud of. I had not always escaped before. If there is one thing in the world that will make a man peculiarly and insufferably self-conceited, it is to have his stomach behave itself the first day at sea, when nearly all his comrades are seasick. Soon a venerable fossil, shawled to the chin and bandaged like a mummy, appeared at the door of the after-deck house, and the next lurch of the ship shot him into my arms. I said, "'Good morning, sir. It is a fine day.' He put his hand on his stomach and said, "'Oh, my!' and then staggered away and fell over the coop of a skylight. Presently another old gentleman was projected from the same door with great violence. I said, "'Calm yourself, sir. There is no hurry. It is a fine day, sir.' He also put his hand on his stomach and said, "'Oh, my!' and reeled away. In a little while another veteran was discharged abruptly from the same door, clawing at the air for a saving support. I said, "'Good morning, sir. It is a fine day for pleasuring. You were about to say, "'Oh, my!' I thought so. I anticipated him anyhow. I stayed there, and was bombarded with old gentlemen for an hour, perhaps, and all I got out of any of them was, "'Oh, my!' I went away then, in a thoughtful mood. I said, "'This is a good pleasure excursion. I like it. The passengers are not garrulous, but still they are sociable. I like those old people, but somehow they all seem to have the, oh, my, rather bad.' I knew what was the matter with them. They were seasick. And I was glad of it. We all like to see people seasick when we are not ourselves. Playing whist by the cabin lamps when it is storming outside is pleasant. Walking the quarter-deck in the moonlight is pleasant. 
Smoking in the breezy foretop is pleasant when one is not afraid to go up there. But these are all feeble and commonplace compared with the joy of seeing people suffering the miseries of seasickness. I picked up a good deal of information during the afternoon. At one time I was climbing up the quarter-deck when the vessel's stem was in the sky. I was smoking a cigar and feeling passably comfortable. Somebody ejaculated, "'Come, now, that won't answer. Read the sign up there. No smoking abaft the wheel.' It was Captain Duncan, chief of the expedition. I went forward, of course. I saw a long spy-glass lying on a desk in one of the upper-deck staterooms, back of the pilot-house, and reached after it. There was a ship in the distance. Uh, uh, h hands off! Come out of that! I came out of that. I said to a deck-sweep, but in a low voice, Who is that overgrown pirate with the whiskers and the discordant voice? It's Captain Bursley, executive officer, sailing master. I loitered about a while, and then, for want of something better to do, fell to carving a railing with my knife. Somebody said in an insinuating, admonitory voice, Now, say, my friend, don't you know any better than to be whittling the ship all to pieces that way? You ought to know better than that. I went back and found the deck sweep. Who is that smooth-faced, animated outrage yonder in the fine clothes? That's Captain L., the owner of the ship. He's one of the main bosses. In the course of time I brought up on the starboard side of the pilot-house, and found a sextant lying on a bench. Now, I said, they take the sun through this thing. I should think I might see that vessel through it. I had hardly got it to my eye when someone touched me on the shoulder and said, deprecatingly, "'I'll have to get you to give that to me, sir. If there's anything you'd like to know about taking the sun, I'd as soon tell you as not. But I don't like to trust anybody with that instrument. If you want any figuring done—' "'Aye, aye, sir!' He was gone to answer a call from the other side. I sought the deck-sweep. "'Who is that spider-legged gorilla yonder, with a sanctimonious countenance?' "'It's Captain Jones, sir, the chief mate.' "'Well, this goes clear away ahead of anything I ever heard of before. Do you—now I ask you as a man and a brother—do you think I could venture to throw a rock here in any given direction without hitting a captain of this ship?' "'Well, sir, I don't know. I think likely you'd fetch the captain of the watch, maybe, because he's a-standing right yonder in the way.' I went below, meditating and a little downhearted. I thought— if five cooks can spoil a broth, what may not five captains do with a pleasure excursion? End of chapter 3